Hi everyone, this is Andrew Hoffman. Once again, I'm a software engineer, a security researcher, and a technical author based out of the Pacific Northwest. This is my YouTube channel where I post videos on topics that interest me. And recently, those topics have been in programming and cybersecurity. Once again, this is a programming tutorial, and this particular tutorial is in regards to something that I think is very complicated, that very few people understand, that will benefit you as any type of developer because you're always going to be interacting with web browsers. Just to get this out of the way, if you like this type of content, consider subscribing. It's the red button to the bottom right of the video in the current YouTube UI. So today we're going to talk about inheritance systems in JavaScript and some classical languages. And we're going to start there and then we're going to work our way into vulnerabilities and ways in which you can actually hack people's code simply because the code relies on an inherent system that is more flexible than others. So let's start right off the bat. Inheritance systems in Java versus JavaScript. So in Java, a classic OOP language, you have very strongly defined relationships between objects. So this is classic OOP. Your relationships between these objects are evaluated at compile time. And that means they can't ever change after an application has been compiled. In other words, if you're writing an application in Java and you have a class called animal and you have a class called dog that inherits from animal, after this is compiled into an exe or some other type of jar ex or any type of executable format, those inheritance relationships are fixed. Now we look at JavaScript, which is the language of the web, and it's a little bit different. In fact, it's, it's wildly different. And JavaScript uses a totally different type of inheritance system to almost any other language out there. It uses what's called a prototypal non-traditional inheritance system. This is a loosely defined system. And one of the biggest differences is it's actually evaluated at runtime. And what that means is in Java, you build your jar file, you run your jar file, your inheritance relationships are fixed. In JavaScript, you write your code, your code is interpreted, and those inheritance relationships can change on the fly. So let's let's talk a little bit more about this because I think this is a really interesting difference in design choice between these two programming languages. So I made some simple diagrams and as you can see right here in Java you write some code, there's some compilation steps, this is very high level and you know then there's some output. In JavaScript you write some code, the code is read by an interpreter, this is often the, the Google Chrome V8 just-in-time interpreter or whatever other engine you're using, could be Node.js. Anyways, you get some output. Now, there's an additional case here though where at runtime there can be modifications that are made to the inheritance hierarchy. And these are fed back into the interpreter, which obviously reinterprets the logic with the new runtime modifications and re-renders and re-executes and re-outputs whatever type of application you're working on. So this is this is kind of an ongoing iterative process, whereas traditional languages, it's like your inheritance hierarchies are pretty much set in stone. So that's pretty cool. That means that JavaScript's more flexible, but as you can imagine, it also makes it quite a bit more dangerous. So let's talk about that a little bit. Traditional languages, in particular languages that are very strictly defined like Java, they're way less flexible, but they're also way easier to debug. So it's like, this is how you set up an inheritance hierarchy. This is how it works. This is how you debug it. You learn that once you're good. Now we go over to the world of JavaScript. We find out that we have a ton of flexibility, but it's becoming much harder to debug, much, much harder. However, it's also much, much more flexible. So they're kind of at the opposite ends of the spectrum even though you know these are languages with similar names, when you look at their design, their design is completely in opposite directions where JavaScript's highly flexible language, write it however you want. Java is a language that out of the box says you write your code exactly like this. And that's probably why it's favored by a lot of corporate environments. Now let's kind of go back to the cybersecurity side of this. What happens when you have a language that has a prototype system that is evaluated at runtime versus being evaluated at compile time? Well, you end up with a type of attack called a prototype pollution attack. That's just a fancy name. I really wanted to explain the issue behind that attack, which is the flexible on-demand inheritance system in JavaScript. 
So let's look at this inheritance hierarchy. You have a data list, and from that inherit support tickets, ticket number one, two, three. You also have customers, which makes use of a data list, containing customer objects for Joe and Sam. Okay. So these are two different separate functionalities in this application, but the way their data is structured, their data all inherits from this data list object. So the customers is a data list, the support tickets is a data list. So if you're a hacker and you know you're working with a JavaScript application, in particular in this case, this would be like a server side JavaScript, probably Node.js application. You can kind of think about how the language is designed when you're looking at ways to exploit the application. In this case, if we have access to the support portal and we want to get access to Joe's data over here, one thing we can think about is, is there any way in which we could write some type of code that would be executed against Joe's account? Well, if we know that the ticket inherits from data list, as does the customer account information object, then there may in fact be a way. And so what we would do is we'd have in our ticket body, we'd have this payload, and the payload modifies data list to send data to server. There we go. So this is kind of prototype pollution in a nutshell. We have access to the support portal. We don't have access to Joe or Sam's customer accounts, but we want to attack them. We figure out that this is a Node.js application and the way the data is modeled in memory is by using a data list object, which is shared between these two separate functionalities. So we attack the data list. We add additional functionality to the data list to make some type of XML HTTP request, hit a server and pass back whatever information we can get. This is prototype pollution. So let's kind of look at prototypes and prototype pollution in a maybe a more practical way. So a lot of times when you see examples in JavaScript, you'll see examples that are using a more OOP style. And in fact, sometimes they can get away with that. And you'll never know that under the hood, you're not actually writing code in an OOP language. In fact, it's just an alias for essentially this. So I can say const data list equals function. So I'm just declaring a function. That function is assigned to an object. And yeah, actually that's all I need. This is basically a class in JavaScript. Now you can use the class keyword, but it's just gonna create something like this under the hood. Now, what I can do here is I can say customers is gonna be equal to a new instance of that data list, just like you could instantiate a class in Java. And I can prove that customers inherits from data list in a couple of ways. So one thing I could do is I could go down here and I could say console.log customers dot instance of customers instance of data list and that should evaluate to true so here we know that customers is indeed inheriting from data list now if we go back to our diagram we can see here that data list powers support tickets and customers okay now one thing to keep in mind as well is almost every object in JavaScript inherits from object, which is kind of this master object that sets up the definition for what an object should look look like. So we can also go here and we can say console.log customers instance of object. So that could be an attack vector. We could, you know, try to attack data list or we could try to attack object. So that's pretty cool. Now, Let's go down a little bit further, and there's another way that we could test this. We could even go a little bit deeper. Instead of using the instance of keyword, we could test directly that the prototypes on these objects match their parents. So we say console.log customers dot underscore underscore proto underscore underscore is equal to data list dot prototype. There we go and we run it, we get another true. So what we're doing here is we're taking this customer object and we're actually looking at this pointer. So in a prototypal inheritance language, what happens is you, on each object, you get a pointer to the parent object. So in this case, customers has an underscore underscore proto that's automatically attached to it by the interpreter that'll point to its parent. Now, interestingly enough, the way the chain works is proto should also have a proto that points to object. So we can try that as well. So you can go all the way up the inheritance chain here. 
So we can say customers dot underscore underscore proto dot underscore underscore proto equals object dot prototype. Now, just just for the record, whenever you're writing JavaScript code, you should avoid accessing the proto directly uh, using the underscore underscore proto, and you should always use dot prototype, which is going to be a pointer to this. So with that out of the way, let's clear, let's click run, and you'll notice we have four trues in the console. Interesting. So what we've determined here is we have this inheritance hierarchy. And unlike in a language like Java, this is inheritance hierarchy that is evaluated whenever we run a function that needs to look up the prototype chain. As a result of this, we might be able to attack data list or attack object in order to attack customers and compromise the data of a specific customer. So let's go up here. We have data list. Let's add a property to data list. Let's say data list dot prototype dot print data equals function. And inside of this function, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say console dot log, or actually we can just call it log. Let's say this is a function that's going to log some information. And we'll say data log to server. There we go. Now, what we can do way down here is we can say customers dot log. And because of the inheritance chain, we will be able to access that log function even though it's in data list because customers inherits from data list. Okay, that's good. Now, if we're going to attack data list and we know that there's a logging function and we know this logging function is being called on a customer, all we have to do is modify the functionality of this log function and that will propagate down to customers whenever it's called. So the prototype pollution attack is as simple as, let's say I have access to the data list object. I know that the data list object is shared between customers and support tickets. So I found a way to get code execution from my, from my support ticket, but I don't care about that support data. I really want to get the customer data, which might include, you know, like something confidential, it might include a credit card number, et cetera. So I'm going to say down here, just going to overwrite it doing data list dot prototype dot log equals function. So we're overwriting this log function and we're going to say, and we could even clone the function if we want to make it difficult to catch. We could clone the function and then we could call that clone and then we could do our own operations. We could put a proxy in front of uh, the operations as well. So in the end, what we want to do is we want to send that data to the server. We, we can still log it. I mean, that might actually be more transparent and harder to find as an attacker because log files will look normal. But ultimately what we want to do is change that functionality. So we go here and we say, data sent to server. There we go. And we start exfiltrating server, exfiltrating data to our own servers. And once again, we go down here, we say customers.log. We run this. And as you can see, we didn't modify the customer's object because we didn't have access to customers. But because we had access to data list, we were able to modify the prototype function called log and start exfiltrating data to our servers. So as a result of this, even though we weren't able to directly access customers, we knew that we could modify the prototype of data list and we knew customers inherited from data list. So by modifying it on the fly, we were able to turn what could be a simple vulnerability into a very high risk vulnerability. We were able to exfiltrate data from functionality that we didn't even have access to. And that's the gist of prototype pollution. And I hope that this video helped to give you an understanding of the differences between various inheritance systems and understand why JavaScript's inheritance system, while very flexible, also introduces a number of security concerns for anyone, especially developing JavaScript-based applications that run on the server. So that's it for today. Thank you for watching and leave any questions or comments you have below the video.